Can everybody hear, first of all? Yes? I will try to project well. Many of you are quite distant. Uh, as Jason said, it's great to see some familiar faces. A number of people seem to have come out of the woodwork tonight. I'm a little apprehensive about what that means, but it's uh, really fun to have you all here. And um, I'm just going to weave a very informal sort of anecdotal story about work that we've been doing on this bird. Some of you are saying, oh, Rimmer and Bicknell's thrush again, still? Um, we've been working on, on this bird, the Bicknell's thrush, for about 25 years, following it from its winter uh, breeding grounds here in the Northeast to its wintering areas in the Caribbean. And um, the last three years, I've been incredibly fortunate to visit the habitats on Cuba, where this bird uh, is now known to be. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And I do encourage you to ask me questions at any point or interject in any way you want. Um, so I feel that I need to give a little bit of background on the bird before I start talking about Cuba. So I'm going to do that. Some of you have heard this, some of this before, but there's, you know, there's uh, some intrigue some suspense, some adventure, there's even a little bit of sex involved. Um, but there's also some science and some conservation. Um, so one of the, and I just want to back up a little bit, one of the paradigms in conservation biology now, conservation science, is called full life cycle conservation. And what that means is that if you're studying and trying to understand the conservation of a migratory animal, whether it's a Bicknell thrush or a scarlet tanager or a monarch butterfly, you must understand its ecology and its conservation at all ends of its range, from where it breeds to where it spends the winter and everywhere in between. Because everything is linked. Uh, events on one area may influence events on the other, so you have to really pay attention to the whole spectrum, the whole range of the bird. And the Bicknell thrush is a great example uh, of, of a bird whose uh, full life cycle conservation is paramount to understanding its conservation. So, we'll get to Cuba in a minute, but first just let me tell you a little bit about this bird, the Bicknell thrush. I do actually have a picture. Some of you, how many of you have seen a Bicknell thrush before? Yeah, a number of you have. Well, it's not the most uh, prepossessing bird in the world. It's, it's small, it's brown, it's secretive. Um, it lives in places that are hard to get to. Here it is here on its, uh, and I'll pass this around. Here's a picture of it on its breeding grounds here in the Northeast. Here's a picture from the Dominican Republic on the wintering grounds. I'll just pass that around. But it's relative of our hermit thrush, our state bird here in Vermont. Um, and it's a rare animal. We think there are only about 100,000 in the entire world. That's a small number for any species of organism. Um, and they're picky about where they live. Here in the Northeast, where they nest, they're restricted to New York, New England, northern New England, and parts of southern Canada and the Maritimes. They're a mountaintop specialist. They breed on uh, mountaintop forests that are generally above 3,000 feet. There aren't many of those, and they're little islands of habitat sprinkled across the landscape, if you think about it. So these birds aren't occupying a big contiguous landscape, but they're scattered and limited on these islands of habitat. Um, so they're rare to begin with, and we know that these islands are subject to an array of threats um, from these mountaintops, from ski area development, to wind turbine development, to telecommunication towers, um, and most profoundly to climate change. That is, as for all life on Earth, one could argue, the, the most profound threat to, to Bicknell thrush. These mountaintop forests, which are, um, consist of fir and spruce trees, coniferous trees, are very dependent on temperature for their distribution, where they can grow. And as the temperature increases, it's pretty clear that these forests are going to start marching up slope to keep pace with the temperatures they need. And as that happens, these islands of habitat are going to get smaller. Some of them are likely to disappear. Well, what's going to happen to Bicknell's thrush? It can't live anywhere else, 
or it won't likely live anywhere else. So, early on, 25 plus years ago, we began getting concerned about this bird. It lives in our backyard here in the Northeast. We didn't know much about it. No one's studying birds on mountaintops. They're hard places to get to. They're hard places to work within. Um, so we didn't know much about big nose thrush. And when we realized that these mountaintop forests were under siege, and acid rain was another early phenomenon that created a lot of attention for mountains and the forests, um, we realized we better pay attention. So I'm going to condense the story at this point and just tell you that we have been paying very close attention to Big Nels thrush now for a quarter of a century. And we've learned a lot. I only have time to provide a few of the highlights about what we've learned. Um, and one of those is a, a fascinating phenomenon which relates to what I'm going to tell you about where they spend the winter in a few minutes. Um, this bird has a very uh, bizarre, unique mating system or breeding system, let's call it. One of our uh, biologists, early on, we were studying the bird. We catch them in mist nets and put uniquely numbered bands on their legs, which identify them for life. And sometimes we'll put unique combinations of colored bands so we can actually see a bird and know exactly who it is without having to catch it and read its numbers in a net. Um, one of our biologists on Stratton Mountain uh, was watching a nest, which in itself is very rare because these nests are hard to find and they're hard to view because the habitat is so thick. So you've all been on mountaintops. You know how dense and impenetrable those forests are. So if you're close enough to see a big nose thrush nest, you're usually too close and the birds won't go anywhere near it because you're three or four feet away. But we got the idea of setting up video cameras. Anyway, our biologists noticed that there were two color banded birds, they had different combinations coming in and feeding the kids, the young, the nestlings, at this one nest. And this happened over a couple of days and that raised all kinds of questions in our mind because that's not really normal behavior. Um, so again, having to make a long story shorter, we put these video cameras up which allowed us to go away and the birds reacted normally, behaved normally at the nest. And lo and behold, over a couple of years, at a hundred plus nests, we learned that 75 percent of these nests had at least two males coming in and feeding the kids. We had one nest on Mount Mansfield that had four different males, uniquely marked males, coming in and feeding the kids. So that again raised all kinds of questions. And we began doing, it, it raised questions of who are the parents of these kids? Um, <laughs> seriously. And, um, so we did paternity testing. We sampled little bits of blood and, and looked at the DNA of the kids and the adults, the, the males. By the way, only, it was never more than one female at any given nest. Um, and we found that the paternity was all mixed up, as you might have predicted. So you could have a nest with, with four uh, chicks, four nestlings, with four different fathers. So, Quick primer on, on avian breeding biology. Females lay one egg a day, generally speaking. Usually they lay a clutch of four eggs. So each egg has to be fertilized independently of the next one or the one before. So theoretically, and it turns out, in fact, you could have four different males for fertilizing four different eggs. And that is what we found. And again, I'm sort of condensing everything. So that was unusual and raised all kinds of questions about why this is occurring. Well, when we looked at all the, the many, many hundreds of birds that we banded over a number of years on Mount Mansfield and Stratton Mountain, those were the two mountains we worked on in Vermont, we found that the ratio of adult males to adult females in the population was more than two to one. So there were twice as many males among the adult population as there were females. And actually some of our colleagues studying the bird in Canada also found the same thing. So, okay, what's going on? Are they laying more male eggs? Nope. When we looked at the sex of the chicks as soon as they hatched, it was one to one. Are the females dying in the nest and there were more males fledging? Nope. One to one. We, we, we knew that. So something clearly was happening between the time Nestlings left their nests and they returned a year later. They can breed at year one of age as breeders. 
All right, now the plot thickens. So we also knew and have since confirmed that Bicknell's thrush winter, they have a very small and restricted breeding distribution here in the Northeast, and they winter on only four islands in the Caribbean, the Greater Antilles, which are the larger islands of the Northwestern uh, Caribbean. They, they winter on Hispaniola, which is the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Cuba, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. That's it. The entire global population is concentrated on those four islands. We knew some of this going into the study, and we confirmed it um, with our own studies since. We spent years and years studying the bird in, on Hispaniola, and we were now confident that that island supports I'm, not, I'm reluctant to give a number, but I will. 80 to 90 percent of the global population of Bicknell's thrush in winter, Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, and Haiti. If you know anything about those two countries, you know that they are not ecologically sound. There's been tremendous amount of habitat loss, especially in Haiti, and the Dominican Republic has is also uh, lost a tremendous amount of forest, 90 percent of its native original forests. So this bird is uh, sort of besieged at both ends of the range. Um, so we spent a lot of time studying them in, in the DR, as we call it, in Haiti. And one of the things we learned there, doing the same kinds of work we've done up here, banding birds, studying their ecology, putting radio um, transmitters on them and following their movements. So here, I didn't mention, but I will now, birds are not, uh, males are not territorial on their breeding grounds, which is unusual among songbirds. Most songbirds have clearly defined territories, the males, which they defend from others of their species. The song sparrows, the robins, the catbirds in your backyard, they all have discrete, small territories. Bicknell's thrush, no. They're moving, we, and we confirmed this with radio telemetry, they're moving all over the place, males overlapping. And it makes sense now that we know that they're feeding um, chicks in different nests, you could have a male feeding a nest here, then going here a hundred meters away. Um, he could have young of his own in this nest. He might have none in that nest. They don't know if they're parents of these kids or not. They don't. A female could mate with several males in a day. Only one's going to be the lucky sire of that day's egg. Um, so if a male mates with a female, it may pay him genetically speaking, to invest time in feeding those young, even if they may not be his. Um, he doesn't know that, but I digress. Uh, so in the DR and Haiti, uh, we studied these birds in different areas, and one of the, we, we learned by sampling their blood, you can't tell the sexes apart uh, in the winter. We can in the summer, even though they look identical to us, to our eyes, they know each other apart, but we don't, unless they're in breeding condition. The females develop a, a patch, it's called an incubation or a brood patch, where they lose all the feathers on their abdomen. It's a nice warm surface to incubate the eggs and brood the young. And the males have a swelling of the cloaca, which facilitates mating. So you can sex them reliably in the summer, but in the winter, we can't. Their males are a little bigger, but they all look the same. But if you take a drop of blood and look at the DNA, then you can get the sex. So we did that over uh, several hundred birds. And we learned that the birds segregate by habitat in the winter, for the most part, not 100 percent. The males are predominating in high elevation cloud forests, forests that are remote, largely inaccessible to humans, and largely undisturbed. They're, they're secure habitats. Females are relegated, shall we say, to lower quality habitats at lower elevation, which are more disturbed by humans. Um, all the birds are territorial in the winter. We did learn that. So it, I told you there is not territoriality up here. Down there, everybody's territorial. Males, females, young birds, older birds. But so there's competition for space. And then we, we think that males being slightly bigger and more aggressive than females are able to exclude many females from the best habitats, the best, the optimal habitats, these high elevation, we call them cloud forests. The females are getting shunted into lower quality habitats. There isn't enough habitat to go around. I'm storytelling here, by the way. We, you know, 
this is all based on what we've learned, uh, but I think it makes a lot of sense. There, there's been so much habitat lost that there, there probably isn't enough of this high quality habitat to go around. The males are able to compete for the best spots, and the females get kicked around and moved into crappy habitats where they may not do as well. They may either, they may not survive the winter, or they might survive the winter but be in relatively poor condition when it comes time to migrate a thousand plus miles back here. Or maybe they make it back here but they're compromised so that they get here, they're exhausted, you get one of those freak late May, early June storms for two or three days of ice and snow and cold temperatures and we don't know exactly what the mechanisms are, but we're pretty certain that lower survival, survivorship on the wintering grounds is compromising the females and probably has led to this skewed sex ratio on the breeding grounds. Why there are so many more males? Because it's not, it's not the natural order of things. So that paints you a little bit of picture. We're concerned about big nose thrush in the first place because its winter habitats are, are under serious threat. But furthermore, the females are in habitats that are even under greater threat. So we've focused a lot of our recent conservation on, we call them female habitats, these areas where there are more females, not necessarily more than males, but more than there are in these other areas. Because if we lose the female, it doesn't matter how well we protect the males, if the females go down the tubes, say goodbye to Bicknell thrush. All right, what does this have to do with Cuba, <laughs> you may be asking? Well, early on, um, we, we knew that Bicknells occurred in Cuba because some Canadian colleagues had done surveys in the late 90s and early 2000s and established that they were there. They found a number of birds in the higher elevation areas of southeastern Cuba. But nobody had really done a systematic survey of the whole island, and we knew there was a fair bit of habitat there. We created a habitat model, a winter habitat model. I say we, I had very little to do with it. I'm not a modeler. Some of you here in this room know way more about modeling than I do. My wife Leslie knows more about modeling than I do. Um, but uh, my colleagues, Kent McFarland in particular, uh, took all the data that we had from Bicknell's thrush, where we found them, what habitats, what elevation, what rainfall, what slope, and put it all together and it created a predictive model of where we would expect to find Bicknell's thrush in the four islands where they occur. And Cuba showed a lot of potentially high quality habitat. So we knew we really needed to, to pay attention to that and, and survey it. Um, so three winters ago, I uh, orchestrated an expedition to Cuba, in part to follow up our Canadian colleagues and the work that they had done 15 years earlier, and in part to expand on that and really try to get a more complete picture of where Bicknell's thrush are and what habitats they're in, and if we could learn how they're doing. So Cuba is uh, not necessarily an easy place to get to um, for Americans. It's become a little less easy in the last few years. But it's a really uh, fascinating country, and I, I think you all know something about its history. Actually, I took a few notes, and I just because I don't know that much about it, but I, I'm just going to, it's a, uh, it's got 11 million people, so it's pretty, uh, it's pretty heavily populated. Two million of those are in Havana. 500,000 or so are in the second largest city in the east where I base myself, Santiago de Cuba. It's about 800 miles long. It's a big island. It's the biggest island in the Caribbean, the biggest of these four greater Antillean <laughs> islands. And it's about 80 kilometers wide average, and it's so it's very long. And most of the mountains are in the southeast, so that's where we focused our initial efforts. Um, and just to give you a very little bit of history, because I think it's pretty interesting, you know, about four to five thousand years BC, there was an, an indigenous people. Actually, there were there were three uh, groups that lived there. The Tainos um, were were the earliest, um, and in about the fifteenth century, it was colonized by the Spaniards. Thanks, Christopher Columbus. Um, and it remained under 
Spanish control basically until the, the Spanish-American War in the late 1800s, uh, at which point the U.S. more or less took over and occupied Cuba. Uh, it became semi-democratic during that time, I understand, uh, but it was a fragile democracy. And uh, in 1952, a dictator named Batista uh, basically took over, uh, imposed the rule of law, and um, people were not happy about that. And this guy, I think you've heard of him, named Fidel Castro came along uh, several years later and fomented a uh, rather daring rebellion, revolution, uh, which overthrew that government and, and basically led to the system that is the in place today, which is a communist or call it socialist uh, system. Um, and I'm not going to get into the politics any more than that, um, but the culture is essentially a, it's very ethnically diverse. Uh, there's still um, remnants of the original indigenous culture. There's um, a lot of Spanish uh, influence. There's African influence because slaves were brought over to grow tobacco and sugar uh, and coffee. Um, and um, there's also some Soviet influence, not surprisingly. So. The economy is dominated by sugar, tobacco, and coffee, and also I, I read skilled labor. Now, I hadn't heard that before, but I think uh, there, are, um, there is a labor force, and it's a very well-educated one. It's very impressive. The, the education of um, the professional cadre in Cuba is truly impressive. Um, all right, let's talk biology again. Uh, there's also tremendous biodiversity in Cuba. Being the largest island, it is uh, the most diverse island. Um, there's a tremendous amount of endemism, which means a tremendous number of plants and animals that live only on that island. All the Caribbean islands are fascinating because they all have a large number, relatively speaking, of endemic species because evolutionarily um, they've been colonized by common ancestors and then uh, over time those have diverged and become uh, separate species. So it's uh, ranked number 15 in the world for a country in terms of its plants. And this is a tiny area compared to a, compared to a place like Colombia or Ecuador or Peru. Um, uh, it's 14th in its diversity of reptiles, 17th in amphibians, and 23rd in birds. There are 27 species of endemic birds on Cuba that occur nowhere else in the world. There are a number of others that are shared with the Bahamas for some reason that I don't really evolutionarily understand. So um, it's really a very, very diverse place. All right, back to Bicknell's thrush and um, my, my time on Cuba. So three years ago, I organized the first trip. Um, we had <laughs> my colleague John Lloyd and I uh, arranged to go down. We had a devil of a time getting the permits we needed the visa and the permits to work in the country. Uh, our current administration has not made it easier to work in Cuba. Um, so after really a couple of months of delays, we had hoped to go in January, which is sort of the middle of the winter, when you want to be there for Bicknell's Rush, you know, during the middle of the, the time that they're there. Uh, we didn't get there till, till late March. We knew that was late, but hey, we had our permits, we had funding from the Canadian government. We can't get any funding from the U.S. government, surprisingly. <laughs> but the Canadians, because Bicknell thrush is actually a federally threatened species in Canada, had a vested interest in, in our work and were eager to have us follow up the sort of exploratory work they'd done 15 years earlier. So they funded us. And we went down and we, we formed a, a, a partnership with a local uh, biological organization called, well, I call them BioEcho. I can never remember their full name because it's long, so I'm going to read it. It's the Centro Oriental de Ecosistemas e Biodiversidad. So uh, they're, they're, they're 150 persons strong. Here, I'm sure they would be a, a nonprofit, an NGO. There, there's no such thing. Everybody works for the government. It is, at some level, supported by the government. Um, but they are an impressive organization working um, not only on animals but plants and uh, applied ecology and 
as I said earlier, the, the level of education down there is it just blows away any of the other Caribbean countries that I've been in. They have a number of PhDs on their staff. You know, education is all paid for by the government there, as is health care, as is much of the housing and um, food. Uh, people make, uh, I'm, I'm jumping around a bit, but uh, the pay, this pay scale, having worked now closely with a number of biologists, is uh, hard to fathom. One of my colleagues, who I've gotten to know very well, he speaks some English. My Spanish is okay. It's not, uh, I'm not fluent. I've gotten better. Um, we were able to converse a lot, and he makes $21 a month. $21 a month. This fellow has a master's degree, 25 years plus of experience. He's incredibly uh, well-educated, well-established, and uh, that's just what people make there. Now, he's not uncomfortable. He's not living in poverty. One of the things that I really loved about being in Cuba and about the Cuban um, society is that because it is socialist, I suppose, um, there's not a lot of uh, class uh, distinction. Um, people are pretty much on an even keel. And that is incredibly refreshing. It really is. I can't tell you how refreshing that is. Having spent a lot of time in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, I love the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Don't get me wrong. The people are wonderful, but you see a, a much greater disparity in socioeconomic status there. And you're always, you feel like you're kind of getting hustled a lot. Even among the people that love you, and they really do, you know, they love us and they have the best of intentions, but they're, you know, they, they know that they can, they can climb the ladder. And they're always, um, in Cuba that, that just doesn't exist. Um, in fact, I wasn't even allowed to pay the people I work with. Um, I gave them something under the table, which for them was uh, a huge boost. But um, legally, I was not allowed to pay them. Now, I couldn't get anyone to work for me in the DR if I didn't pay them. And I understand that. Anyway, it's not a value judgment. I'm just saying it's really uh, a very refreshing aspect of being in Cuba. Um, so uh, I, I formed this really strong alliance with our, with our sister organization, BioEco. Um, they devoted uh, a number of people to this project. They're very excited about it. Uh, Bicknell's Thrush was not really on their radar. They didn't know anything about it. Um, but they recognized the importance of, of having this migratory bird occupying their country, which forms an alliance between our two continents. And they were, they were eager to help. And I couldn't have done what we did without them. So, so the first year, uh, our goal was really to go back into the highest mountain range, which is called Sierra Maestra. And again, we're, all, we're talking about the southeastern quadrant of the country, which is where the big mountain ranges are. Sierra Maestra is the biggest mountain range. Uh, it has all the highest peaks. The highest peak in Cuba is um, almost 2,000 meters, which is about 6,500 feet. These are big mountains. And when you're standing on the top of Pico Torquino, which is the biggest peak, you're looking right down on the ocean below you. It's, it's impressive. But it's a long way to go up. <laughs> so uh, we, we um, loaded ourselves up with uh, backpacks. So we, we did have the help of mules that year, thankfully, and hiked up uh, several thousand meters um, over several kilometers to a, a, a station. Now, one, one of the wonderful things about Cuba and I wish this was the case in Hispaniola, where the bulk of Bicknell's thrush spend the winter, is it's, it's got a really uh, well-established and, and well-run uh, system of protected areas. Um, they've done a really good job. Um, they're, they're fortunate in a way that there's not a lot of incentive for people to go into these areas and extract the resources, because it's not a capitalist society. You can't you just, there's no point in that, really. Um, but they've also devoted resources to these protected areas. There's infrastructure, there are park guards, there are, there are, are buildings, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it gave us a base, and it's also made them much more secure than they would otherwise be. So we hiked up to this uh, very rustic base camp. All the cooking was done over a small fire, um, but the guards there, uh, did all our cooking for us. We brought the food, so that was wonderful. 
and uh, they enjoyed that. And they'd make uh, their strong coffee, which they, they make there by um, pouring the coffee in a little uh, sort of a cloth uh, um, drainer, like a strainer in a, in a little loop. And they pour the coffee in that, and then they put that in a big pot, uh, pour the water in, uh, stir it around for minutes, and then they put about two cups of sugar in. <laughs> so uh, I came to like Cuban coffee quite a lot. <laughs> 4 a.m. in the morning, that sweet and yes. Can I ask you a question? Please. Yeah. So as you go up in elevation, uh, you pass through different forest zones. The highest zone, and the really where we find the Bicknell's thrush, is called cloud forest. It's a very, it is very wet. It's it's in the clouds a lot. It gets a, a lot of rainfall, two thousand millimeters of rain a year, I think. These cloud forests, they're they're absolutely magical, spectacular habitats. Um, there are some really large trees. They're just dripping with um, epiphytes, bromeliads, and orchids, and moss, and lichen. Uh, there's nobody up there. Uh, it's really um, it's a magical place to be. Uh, hard to get to, but once you're there, it's, um, it's very enchanting, to me, anyway. Uh, I, I love that habitat. And it's similar to the forest in the Dominican Republic in Haiti where the birds are actually very similar. Some of the, even the, the same or similar plants. Um, so anyway, our routine, and this is, I'm going to the first year, uh, was to get up at absurdly early hours because we wanted to be up. Bicknell's is a very crepuscular bird. If you know that word, it means that its activities are very concentrated at dawn and dusk. That's when they vocalize. And the, the, really the only way to know that a Bicknell's thrush is there is to hear them. You never see the darn things. You do, even up here, we, can, we hardly ever see them in the summer. But they do vocalize. Now, of course, in the summer, they sing and they call a lot because they're, they're breeding. In the winter, though, they do actually vocalize, um, mainly at dawn and dusk. But they'll also respond to a playback. So if you play back a Bicknell's thrush um, call, which they mostly call in the winter. Males are the ones who sing, and that's mainly a summer thing. I'm going to play the call of a big nail stress, just because I know not every one of you has heard one. Um, so if you get out there at the right time of day, and you only have about three or four hours at the most in the morning before things shut down and the birds get quiet, um, they will respond. And that, indeed, is what we do. We have a standardized protocol. We go to a point. We stand there for 10 minutes, and we do four two and a half minute counts. We repeat them one after another. And after the first count and the third count, we do a minute of playback. And if the bird's there, 98 times out of 100, you're going to hear it. And so that's how we found them. Once in a while, we hear one singing or calling of spontaneously, but not very often. So let me just play you. Uh, I have a few calls of the local birds that I'm going to play on my computer. But this, I'll just pull out my trusty iPhone. Um, it's, I know some of you have heard this, but I know not all of you have. It's a nasal piercing sort of call. I know that's hard to hear. But they do that. That's how they advertise their territories in the winter. Um, and they do have these discrete territories, as I mentioned. So the birds are vocalizing. So anyway, we'd, we'd want to be up there by first light, which in February, let's say, is you know around 6, 6.15 in the morning. So uh, we often had a two-hour hike to get up to some of these high elevations from where we we're staying. So we'd you know, get up early, drink our highly sweetened coffee, put on the headlamps, put on our day packs, and just start trudging. And it was straight up, I'm telling you. <laughs> My knees felt like hamburger at the end of the day. But um, sure enough, we found birds. And to make uh, a long story a little bit shorter, that first year, we covered about five miles of habitat over which the Canadians had found 15 to 20 birds 15 years earlier. We didn't find any, not a single one. And we did this over several days. We were there at just the right time of day. The weather conditions were perfect. We did not find a big nose thrush. 
So that was very perplexing and sort of concerning. And I felt like I'd wasted a lot of money, potentially. Um, we did go to one other area east of there, another slightly lower part of the mountain range, and we, we, we managed to find two birds there. Uh, that, that had not been surveyed by the Canadians. But, so we did find two birds, so phew, all right. They're not extinct on Cuba. Um, but it raised lots of questions. We went to one other area further east, didn't find any, another uh, area, a mountain area, smaller, uh, lower elevation. Um, so we knew that we needed to follow up. This was an exploratory uh, survey. This was a way to get to know our colleagues uh, and establish the, a good working relationship. So last winter, uh, a year ago plus, I went back earlier. I got my permits well in advance, my visa, and I arrived in late January. Met the same group, BioEcho, uh, who were eager to have us again. And we went up to the same area of the Sierra Maestra, the Pico Turquino National Park, the area of highest elevation where the Canadians had done most of their work. Um, we found seven birds <laughs> over the same distance. We managed to catch a couple of them in a mist net and put bands on their legs. We confirmed that, oh yeah, okay, they are Bicknell thrushes. We're not being fooled by some look-alike or sound-alike species. Um, but still, uh, for the amount of work we did, that was a pretty small number of birds. Um, after I left, our, our colleagues went to another, the, really the largest area of this whole mountain chain, um, the Baya Mesa National Park, and they found uh, another dozen birds there, which was great. That area had not really been surveyed before, so that was encouraging. Um, still left a number of questions. This bird, you know, over the 25 plus years I've been studying it, every time I do any kind of study, I have more questions than answers. That's just the way biology is, first of all, science in general, but particularly with this enigmatic creature. Um, so I decided, well, we need to do one more year, at least one more year. Um, so I must manage to convince my Canadian colleagues to pony up one more time. They're not giving us millions of dollars, trust me. Um, but enough to go down, just myself. Uh, and I went down in late January. And we decided to focus. We'd done the Pico Turquino area twice and felt we probably had a pretty good handle on that. But this Baya Mesa area of this really extensive area, some of it had never been explored before. Uh, as far as my colleagues knew, it was plausible, if not likely, that no human being had ever set foot in some of this mountain range because the ancient um, Tainos probably wouldn't have gone up there. Um, it wouldn't certainly have been a travel route. It's just too remote and steep and difficult. They wouldn't have been growing crops up there. There's nothing to hunt up there. There's only a couple of mammals on Cuba, which are small. They're not game animals. Um, so we decided that we would cut a new trail, trailblaze into a couple of peaks that had, as far as we knew, never been visited, never been surveyed. Um, and that was our mission. So again, we loaded up the backpacks. This time we had no mules because my flight got delayed by a snowstorm here. So the mules were ready the day before, because I, I, I got delayed by a day. The mules were all ready to go the day before we got there. When we got there, they were off doing something else. So I said, all right, put on backpacks. And that was, uh, that was a rugged hike. Um, this time we didn't have a base camp. We made our own base camp with tents uh, at about 1,500 meters elevation, um, which was just at the end of where the group the year before had surveyed. So everything beyond that was sort of new. And, and we set up, and uh, there were four of us, three Cubans and me. No, there were five of us, four Cubans and me. Um, they each had their own tent, two, two per tent. And so the first day we get there and we're just figuring out where to put the tents and uh, where to put the kitchen. And uh, so they put up their two tents right next to each other in about the only flat spot that existed in this. And then they put, we had a big tarp. And I thought that's going to be great because we knew it could rain. And well, they put the tarp right over the tents. <laughs> so I thought, don't you usually put the tarp where you're going to be hanging out and staying out of the rain? Well, I didn't say that, but um, well, that was fine. That was fine. Um, the next day, a cold front 
moved in. An unusually severe cold front, actually one that spawned uh, tornadoes in Havana, far, far to the west. I've never even been to Havana, which actually killed four people. Uh, we didn't get those, but we got this four days of cold, windy, wet weather, <coughs> which really uh, did hamper our ability to do some of the work we'd have liked to do, not to mention being a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I had wet sh boots for four solid days, which you, know, you just you get used to it. <laughs> we all had wet boots, so everybody was in the same boat, and, and we had a great time. There was so much spirit and enthusiasm and humor and just uh, laughing. And, uh, but so we'd hike up to this peak, Pico Baya Mesa, and then from there, the, the trail did go up to that. It was about a kilometer beyond our, above our camp. And then from there, we were into uncharted territory. So three of the Cubans with us were the designated trail cutters. They had machetes um, and m me and one of the biologists. Um, we were the bird guys. So we would go off and do whatever we could do, which often wasn't as much as we'd like in the rain. Um, the problem was uh, that it was so wet and so steep and so slippery with the rain that we couldn't make nearly the progress we'd hoped. We'd hoped to get about 10 kilometers to this first of these two peaks. We'd hoped to get to the second, too. We got about a third of the way there. They'd go out in the morning and do what they could. The one guy actually cut his leg with a machete because it was dangerous. They weren't about to let me wield a machete. <laughs> Probably a good thing. Um, so we were a little bit stymied in being able to get, but we still we made it, you know, two or three kilometers uh, into this uncharted territory, and uh, we did find some birds. We found eight Bicknell thrushes up there. Uh, we managed to catch three of them in our nets, um, and again confirming that they were indeed Bicknell thrushes. Uh, we also confirmed, or, or uh, very likely confirmed, that. The birds in these cloud forests, as in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, are mostly males. All the birds we caught were large. Males are bigger. They have long wings. Uh, every bird that we caught had a pretty long wing. So we're pretty certain that the same situation applies in Cuba as it appears to in Hispaniola. What the females are doing is still uh, a big question. So I better check the time. I may be prattling on. Oh, it's 9.30, huh? <laughs> uh, so that was, I mean, it was a wonderful expedition. It was successful overall. We, we did find birds. We, we did uh, establish um, that they are in, in this, uh, this area. Uh, it's a huge area. I'm sure it's got uh, the biggest population on the island. In fact, I'm sure that Cuba harbors the second largest population to Hispaniola on the wintering range. Um, and that's a good thing because, as I said, these areas are so well protected, really. They're very secure compared to Hispaniola, where protected areas almost mean nothing there. There's no infrastructure, no resources to support them, people going in and out and doing almost whatever they want um, with impunity. Um, so that was, a, that was a magnificent trip. Our, f our food was interesting, in addition to the coffee, which is mostly what I consumed. Um, <coughs> We were cooking on a little camp stove, and we had to bring all our food up, right? So you don't want to bring too much, and you don't want to bring a lot of stuff in cans. And they didn't want to bring anything like rice that's heavy. So we had about six big bags of soda crackers <laughs> and uh, one jar of peanut butter, which I brought. Peanut butter is pretty much non-existent on Cuba, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, they had some cans of tuna. Uh, our food was not. Um, not the stuff of, of legend, but every night we'd have either pasta, <coughs> instant mashed potatoes. <coughs> Actually, we had instant mashed potatoes every night, no matter what. I had brought some freeze-dried meals that I bought at EMS. Um, they didn't really like those. Uh, they weren't bad, but we had a couple of those. And so I lost, you know, about six or eight pounds. I don't know what it was, but this is. It was fine. I was, I was healthy. I was happy. I was energetic. Um, but we all laughed about the food. I mean, actually, instant mashed potatoes 
never tasted so good. <laughs> when you're hungry, you'll eat just about anything. So at the end of our week, we were up there for a week. Um, the weather broke on the last day, literally, and we, we hiked back down and um, went back to the Santiago for one night and then uh, engineered another expedition to a different mountain range further east where we had hoped to get into the most uh, most undisturbed, highest elevation area. Well, there had been a, a massive um, rainstorm several months before, actually. <coughs> Must have been in the fall, which had completely washed out the roads. We would have had to hike 45 kilometers to get to the city. So we had to scrap that plan, which wasn't really known until we were about ready to do it. So we, we hiked to a whole totally different area. Not as likely an area for Bicknells. We were in the pine forest. Um, there was some habitat where I thought maybe they could be in the understory, uh, but we never found one until the day we we're descending uh, back to the lowlands to go back to Santiago de Cuba. We were doing point counts, we call them, as on our way down. <coughs> and in this area at about 700 meters elevation, 650 meters, which is quite a bit lower than any Big Nels Thrush had ever been found before. Uh, doing my playback. Psh, psh, psh. There was a Big Nels Thrush um, in this disturbed patch of forest, uh, pines emerging from it, uh, people living around it. It was outside the national park in a protected area, but a different kind of protected area where they allow some um, sustainable uh, use. Um, and there was this bird. We managed to catch it. It was a small bird. I think it was a female. Um, we were out of time. We got back. We're all scratching our heads. Okay, well, this complicates things. Um, my colleagues actually went back two weeks later after I'd left, and they found three more in the same habitat very close by. So this is... <laughs> This has opened up a whole can of worms about the biology and, and conservation status of big nose thrush on Cuba. Uh, they weren't able to catch them. No, nope, they weren't. They tried, and uh, yeah, it's not always guaranteed that you're going to catch these birds because you put up a net and you put down the playback and you go away. Half the time they follow you and yell at you, uh, <laughs> and once in a while they go into the net. I, I done it so much that I'm, I've gotten pretty good at it, but they hadn't had experience. And anyway, five minutes. I'm almost done. Um, so we don't know, but we do know that Bicknell's thrush is not only in the cloud forest, which was the conclusion we were reaching. Uh, and, and in a way, that's uh, complicating, but in a way, it's, it's encouraging. The bird is able to apparently adapt and use other kinds of habitat. Uh, we're going to need to figure that out. Uh, I think the Canadians are sick and tired of throwing money at us, <laughs> so I'm going to be coming to all of you and asking you to help fund our work in Cuba for the next couple of years. No, I'm kidding, but <clears throat> um, there is a lot more work to do. Uh, I am encouraged by the fact that we've found birds in a number of different areas. These areas are well protected. Um, we need secure habitat on the wintering grounds. We're trying like the Dickens in the Dominican Republic and Haiti to achieve that, it's complicated, and I won't get into all the ways that we're trying to do that, but it all involves our local partners and getting them uh, on the ground. Our job as biologists studying this migratory animal on its wintering grounds is not to dictate what should be done. It's to build the capacity of our partners to do the work themselves. This, this is their country, or these are their countries, and, and they really have the ultimate responsibility, and they want it. In fact, one of, so I'll, I'll end on this. One of the most meaningful aspects of my work down there for the last quarter century has been working with my local counterparts. They are so, most of them are younger than me, um, so they have a, a, a real future ahead of them, and, and they are so eager and so committed and so dedicated to uh, doing what needs to be done. And they, they seek our guidance, they, they seek our help, they seek our resources when we can apply them. But, the, but they are ready to take on that challenge. And that is really encouraging to me. Uh, and it, it's uh, been tremendously rewarding. And I think 
if anything, uh, we've made a difference on that score primarily. Uh, at least that's how I feel. Uh, my, my legacy may well be that I've, I've helped create this cadre of committed, um, well um, capacitated individuals who are going to carry on the work. There's a tremendous amount left to be done. There's a lot of hurdles to overcome, but I've got to be optimistic. We all do, right? There's so many things to not feel so optimistic about. Um, you've got to grab onto the ones you can, and I, I do feel optimistic. I really do. So I'm going to stop there, open it up to questions. Uh, that was a shotgun approach, but there you have it. Sure. Oh, well, l l let this uh, gentleman ask a question. He had his hand up. Then I will. Uh, I actually have a two-part question, so if you want to go first, sir. No, no, you go ahead. Are you sure? Okay. Uh, uh, a couple of things. One, um, I, I spent uh, my junior and senior year um, in Andros, um, which is the largest mm -hmm. island of the Bahamas, but one of the least populated. And I was listening to you talk about... <coughs> Vermilias and orchids and the plant life, uh, which I think is so important to the overall process of things. Um, have you noticed a difference in what's happening in Cuba as well as uh, the Dominica, Dominican Republic? Um, and then the second part of the question is, how can we get more uh, younger people involved in what we're talking about and what we're doing? Um. <clears throat> well, one of the, uh, I didn't mention this, and I probably should have, uh, one of the predictions of a changing climate in the Caribbean is that there's going to be a drying trend, uh, and it's already apparently underway. Um, the last few winters have been extraordinarily dry, um, and so the prediction is as these cloud forests receive less and less moisture, they're going to dry up, they're going to become less humid, some of the Plants that are supported by that moisture regime are not going to survive in the same way, and that could have profound consequences for all life that uses those forests. Um, particularly, though, these are blue holes. So this is the largest source of water uh, from the, the Caribbean. That's right. Um, and the, the density of the water is on top, being fresh, uh, and you know the salt water on, on the bottom. Um, and this is something that's depleting. So, how, 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 I didn't mean to interrupt you, sir. I just no, no. Well, um, one of the strategies we're trying to use with um, the, the agencies in the Dominican Republic, particularly, that are responsible for managing these protected areas, many of which are at high elevation, is that you want clean water for your people living down below, you got to protect these forests. And, and I think that resonates at some level. Uh, I do. Um, it's, you know, not a compelling enough argument on its own to uh, achieve conservation, but it's part of the equation, part of the um, argument that you have to put forward. Um, boy, as far as getting young people involved, I mean, I feel like we're, we're doing that down there as best we can. Uh, do you mean how do we get young people up here involved? Yeah, or? yeah, I, I do mean that because I'm sure they. Ty, what do you think, here. buddy? Yeah. <laughs> do we have, we have a we have a young person here yeah, who we'll now th th <laughs> this young man has been with me on Mount Mansfield each of the last two summers for an nice. overnight visit. He has handled more Bicknell thrushes than probably anyone else in this room, awesome. other than Jason maybe. Um, so, yeah, we got to get more youth engaged and interested and uh, caring. Uh, how do we do that? Boy, it's got to... father of three, and, we, and uh, I'm, I'm pushing him for it, but <laughs> how can we, yeah. how can we like, push this influenza? Like, how can we make it happen, you know? Internships. <laughs> yeah, internships. Um, we offer internships, not for kids quite Ty's age, yeah. uh, but we have two interns every summer that work on Bicknell's Rush, on Loons, on other projects. Um, yeah. They're just so well spoken. They're I the mean, future. I, I wish your courage and well, intensity would, would well, push on to the youth, you know. 
Well, we're, you know, we're all in this together, and um, you know, if uh, we all need to, we all need to spread that message. I, I don't know what else to say, really. Yes, Penny. Um, Costa Rica has cloud forests. Oh yeah, many other countries do at high elevations. Do they go that high? No, no, they really don't. For whatever evolutionary reasons, they're confined to these four islands, and we know that. There's been a lot of work done. In elsewhere in Latin America, and nobody has ever found a big Nels thrush. And I've even been to other islands looking for them. I went to Dominica in the Lesser Antilles because if any island was going to have them, we thought that one would. It's, it's very wooded and pristine. Didn't find any there. So um, yeah, their, their evolutionary history has sequestered them on those four islands, and that's, that's where they are. I don't think that they're going to move. Yeah. So Chris, how do you get the estimate of 100,000? Oh, Jason, Jason, where are you? This is Jason's work. He's out there somewhere. <laughs> well, Jason took Mountain Birdwatch. He mentioned Mountain Birdwatch uh, at the beginning when he introduced me. Um, that is our citizen science monitoring program for high elevation birds, including Bicknell thrush. So Jason, uh, Jason. We have a question about how did, how did we come up with 100,000 as a population estimate? Come up with 100,000 or so. Um, you know, amazingly, the very sophisticated uh, Bayesian technique we developed to estimate population size matched incredibly well to the literally back of the envelope calculation that Chris <laughs> and colleagues did by taking like how many birds we think are on Mansfield, and let's see, how big is Mansfield, and how much habitat is in northeastern U.S., and extrapolating. Um, I mean, really, the estimates are incredibly similar. The model that we used um, uses 20,000-some point counts collected by citizen scientists volunteers in a, in a model that statistically accounts for imperfect detection probability and time of year and habitat relationships and estimating density. Um, at different parts of different elevational zones, and it was incredibly similar to the back end. So I'm happy to talk shop. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a quantitative ecologist, but you want to talk models. <laughs> maybe, maybe another question or two? Sure. And I'll stick around. Yeah, Gail. Um, curious about the breeding that you found with the, the multiple males, you know, attending to the nest. That could be a whole talk in itself. I know. It's fascinating. I, know. I you know, was in Florida and helped with scrub jay work. So I'm, it, could you consider that almost like some cooperative breeding? Do you think these are like previous siblings coming back and helping their mother? Or, or do you have that data? Or do you think well, we don't, we, we don't have that data. Uh, I, I, I really don't think that's the case because we, we've got males, you know, that are visiting multiple nests and um, yeah, it's such a scrambled, mixed up uh, system that I don't think there's any, and plus, you know, the, most of the cooperative breeders are year-round residents like the scrub jays in Florida. Uh, these guys are away for six or seven months of the year, which I should just say, we think of these birds, many of our migrants that are now returning and many more to come. Uh, as our birds, they're only here for four months, maybe five. <laughs> they're spending most of the year somewhere else. So we have to be careful about that um, sentiment and realize that we share the responsibility. Um, you have had your hand up before. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, Ted, we'll, curious, we'll sneak you, you in. mentioning the support network down in uh, Cuba. And uh, I'm just curious how that compares you know, in your opinion, to the support network that we have up here in terms of conservation um, efforts and, you know, sort of the citizen involvement and the things that you see will really make a difference? Yeah, it's hard to answer that uh, succinctly. Um, there is not a lot of citizen engagement in um, conservation biology down there. In fact, I don't really think that Cuba has developed a citizen science uh, ethic. There's a little bit in some of the other countries, like the Dominican Republic. Um, that could be coming. I think kids are well educated there and aware of their surroundings. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I don't necessarily know. Um, but I, uh, so the support system overall is good in the professional arena. 
but I think below that, it's still. You say they're comparable between this country and down there? Or? It's really hard to compare the two countries. Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, the resources are, are certainly not available. Uh, the technology is really, I mean, these folks, a lot of them don't even have laptops. Um, they're, you know, they don't, a lot of them don't have very sophisticated uh, data analysis mm -hmm. tools that we have here. Um, but they have the commitment and the capacity to learn it. And so I, I really think um, that is possible and that I hope will come. So Ted, why don't you wrap it up? I, I know this, this gentleman behind me had a question. Oh, Jim, okay. Two more, two more, and then I promise I'll turn. Go ahead, Ted. Who, who was Bicknell? Yeah. How did he discover this? Oh, Dave, I'm sorry. Uh, All right, you're, you're next, uh, Jim. The question may not be relevant, but you talked about uh, Puerto Rico. Yes. You didn't mention that at all. Uh, no, I didn't. Um, and also, that had a hurricane, as, as did the Dominican. And, uh, but it probably at the time of year when the flesh weren't there. I'm just thinking, did it, did it affect the habitat at all in ways you could monitor on with, with uh, long-term data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, well, uh, so Puerto Rico, very quickly, we have done a two-year study on Puerto Rico, and we found very few big nose thrushes. We found 11 birds in two winters uh, of hard-looking, using a bunch of Puerto Rican colleagues. Um, it just appears to be a rare, very local bird there. Um, the hurricanes that came through in, uh, was it two years ago? Yeah. They devastated that island, as you all know, and they did change the habitat. Um, we don't know the effects on Bicknell's thrush. We worry about hurricanes because they often come during the fall when the birds are migrating, not just Bicknell's thrushes, um, or when they're already there. Um, Hurricane Sandy devastated eastern Cuba in 2012. Uh, the, some of the birds were probably already there or just arriving. Uh, we don't really know what effects it had on them because we weren't there then and nobody else was studying them. But I think hurricanes are definitely uh, a short-term uh, phenomenon that could, could wreak havoc. It could create habitat uh, down the road. Well, that's uh, one of the biggest problems in Farfano with the, the, yeah. the opposite side of the island where San Juan is, is that they had absolutely lost due to this uh, newest hurricane uh, two years ago, um, they almost lost, I don't know, what, 15% percent, percent of the species, which was, that's a huge amount. I even yeah. know when you're only like talking, what, 12 or 14 uh, birds, but still, it's still a tough thing. To yeah. Well, if anyone wants to hear more about Puerto Rico, I'll, I'll talk about it, but I'm going to uh, finish with... Um, Jim's question about Mr. Bicknell himself? Is that what you're wondering? Yep. All right. Here's the quick story of Bicknell's thrush and how it got its name. On June 15, 1881, some of you have heard this before, I know, an amateur uh, ornithologist and really more of a botanist who was a financier based on Long Island, Eugene P. Bicknell, was on Slide Mountain in the Catskills of New York, the biggest mountain in the Catskills. And he knew his birds very well. And he spied these two unfamiliar thrushes up near the top. And he didn't recognize them. Um, so as ornithologists did back then, he didn't have the Swarovskis or Leica scope, but he had a shotgun. So he collected them and sent them down to the Smithsonian. And they were identified as a new, uh, at that time it was a subspecies of the gray cheek thrush, which is a more northern and widely distributed bird. Um, but that's how the bird got its name. In 1995, Bicknell's thrush became a distinct species, so, which it is still, some people argue that, from the gray cheek thrush. Um, and that's the quick story of Bicknell's thrush. So I'm going to end. I will hang around. If anyone wants to talk more, I'm happy to. But thank you all for being here. <laughs>